don't know this, but for I'm telling you, uh, this is my third take, so hopefully this kind of goes well. Uh, today we're going to talk about something that is near and dear to my heart and to everybody's heart, trains. Everybody loves trains. Trains are awesome. Um, and in this case, we're going to talk about a specific kind of train, the Transcontinental Railroad. And now, uh, this, these lectures are being done for an AP class, although if you're not in an AP class, you're more than welcome to watch. Um, and it is rare in an AP class that we get to talk about something as specific as, uh, as the Transcontinental Railroad. But um, I wanna, I'm doing it for a couple of reasons. And one, uh, because this issue is huge, uh, even though we're talking about a specific thing. Um, and two, it is a good opportunity for me to really introduce some of the themes of AP that I haven't necessarily highlighted in the last 29 lectures. So uh, with another further ado, let's, uh, let's get into this. So before we get started, uh, essential question. We're going to analyze the influences of the uh, construction of the Transcontinental Railroad. Ooh, I gaffed up the uh, grammar there. Uh, but this deals with key concepts at point two, point two in the AP Guide. Um, now, I, it, it, it's, it, sometimes it's hard to actually consider and to think that during the Civil War, uh, some non-Civil War legislation was, in fact, passed. Uh, don't forget, we had a situation in which uh, Northern Republicans, former Whigs in many cases, uh, could pass legislation that they'd been trying to pass for many, many years, but uh, legislation that had been blocked by Southern Democrats. And now they, the, the, the floor was pretty much open to pass this legislation. Among these bills was the Homestead Act of 1862. And the Homestead Act of 1862, is going to open up the prairies uh, to being uh, to being settled. Uh, and what it will do is it'll actually give you, if you were so inclined, to get a free chunk of land, 160 acres, as a matter of fact. Um, and all you had to do with, for that 160 acres was live on the land for five years and make it develop, develop it, and make it earn, earn a profit. Uh, and then you got to keep your land. Also, uh, if you didn't want to go that route, you could actually pay, uh, I think it was like $1.25 an acre, uh, and stay on the land for six months, and then that land was yours. Either way, it was a huge, huge giveaway of publicly owned lands. And, um, and the idea was to encourage Western development. And people would literally, uh, when they would, the uh, surveyors would go out and survey the land and, uh, and place their... Uh, place their uh, stakes in the land, and uh, people would gather up on these starting lines, and somebody would fire off a gun, and people would run uh, hell-bent for leather into the, uh, into the prairies until they found a piece of land, and then they would pull up their stakes, and they would uh, claim that piece of land as their own territory. Uh, living on the uh, prairies was no easy task. It was, uh, it was not necessarily a fun thing. Um, we can kind of take a look at this uh, hardy-looking family here. And, ah, oh, man, I hate it when the, the magic pen doesn't work. Hold on, let me try this again. Um, here these folks are. Uh, well, think about it. You're living out on the plains, right? And uh, everywhere you look, there's miles and miles and miles of grass. So you get out there, you, uh, you've, you've pulled up your stakes, you've staked your claim, and, uh, well, what are you going to build a house with? There's no trees for miles around, so the only thing that you have is this sod. Fortunately, you've got plenty of sod. You don't need the sod. Uh, you get your trusty plow, steel plow, which made uh, settling the plains possible, and you start cutting square sections of the sod, and then you stack that sod up uh, to make your house. Uh, these houses were known as soddies, and the sod houses were literally made from dirt. And you would stack them up much like you would use bricks, and that's where you would live. You lived inside these sod houses. Uh, you can see right off the bat that this is probably not the easiest lifestyle that one could, uh, one could participate in. Nobody in this picture is smiling, which was not unusual for the 19th century. Um, but, um, but uh, where'd my little, hold on. Ah, oh, there it is. Okay, so let's get rid of that. Um, but either way, um, many, many millions of people did take advantage of this, uh, of this, uh, of this particular act. Now, but most crucial to our uh, purposes here was another piece of legislation that was passed in 1862 called the Pacific Railway Act. And the idea behind the Pacific Railway Act is to, um, to link the uh, California to the rest of the country. So what we can see here is um, the idea of this is to link, uh, in this case... Uh, Interruption. With the following teachers, please report to, to Omaha, Nebraska, Ms. to Ms. Sacramento. Ms. Kohler, and I'm not gonna. Um, Haskin and Medina. Uh, Thank you. The the thing just knocked me 
off, but that's all right. Um, the idea is to link this to uh, link Omaha, Omaha, Nebraska, and to uh, Sacramento, and that would thereby link uh, Sacramento to the rest of the country using railroads. It was a pretty bold, um, bold plan, and to do this, uh, two corporations were chartered. One was called the Union Pacific. Uh, notice the word Union in there. Of course, the Civil War is, is just going on. And the Central Pacific. And the, um, the goal was to uh, work with the, the Union Pacific, would start in Nebraska and move its way west. And the uh, Central Pacific would start in Sacramento and move its way east. Uh, and ultimately, they would meet in the middle-ish, which didn't actually turn out to be the middle. It actually turned out to be Ogden, Utah, but whatever. Um, and, um, and, and, to, and to connect these trains. Now, the building actually gets started pretty much toward the end of the Civil War. They, they start the, the building in, uh, in earnest. And, um, and in return, now, many of the, the builders and the investors in this, they didn't really want to do this. The idea, well, there was nobody out there except angry Indians, so we really don't want to, want to do this. But the government instead gave a huge, huge grant. Um, uh, the, uh, they gave land grants. And the idea was that the railroad would be given a right-of-way of 100 yards on either side of the railroad track. So we're looking at 200 yards uh, of, of land uh, riveting through the, uh, through the prairies and through the mountains. And then uh, beyond that, the, uh, the railroads would be given a square mile, uh, alternating, they would be given 10 square miles uh, on a, in a 20-mile stretch on either side of the railroad tracks. Uh, and these would be alternating square miles. So what ended up happening is you had a situation where you had a, um, a checkerboard kind of pattern crossing the plains in which every other square mile was owned by, by a, the, uh, the railroad and uh, owned by the government, owned by the federal government or federal lands. Um, and these would alternate, and of course, uh, we would swap lands, and we would buy lands, and, uh, and, and trade, and sell in this real estate. But either way, now, because of all of these grants, this actually made things a little more worthwhile. Uh, and in 1864, we will actually amend the law uh, so that any, um, any railroad tracks that are made on a flat, uh, you know, straightaway, uh, would be, would, the government would give $15,000 a mile, and uh, anything that was built through the, uh, through the mountains would be $48,000 a mile. So we're even going to lump, you know, all right, the land grant wasn't enough, here's some cash. We'll, we'll, we'll give you some cash to get this thing started. Another uh, reason why investors might actually want to uh, build the, this railroad is cheap labor. Cheap labor is going to be a central part in, uh, in making sure that these, uh, these, these railroads get done. Uh, mostly uh, looking at I, vast numbers of Irish immigrants who'd come in looking for work. Uh, many of them started working for the Union Pacific Railroad. Uh, and also vast numbers of Chinese immigrants coming in, escaping the, uh, uh, the, the instability that was taking place in China at the time. Uh, these Chinese workers were coming in, and uh, they were going to work largely for the Central Pacific Railroad and start working their way west. Uh, so, for, so when we take a look at these laborers, of course, we can kind of see where we're coming from. The, this is an example of the the Irish immigrants that were working along, you see how they're working, they're working along relatively flat prairies. <coughs> of course, they were also working among uh, Native Americans who really did not appreciate their presence, and at any given time, uh, these folks may have to stop what they were doing and, um, and start shooting at Indians. Um, of course, the Chinese, you would kind of see here, are actually working through uh, very, very arduous circumstances, uh, working through the mountains, uh, the Sierra Nevada mountains, and in some cases they were literally pushing through inch by inch, uh, digging their way through solid rock in order to, uh, to, lay, these, uh, to lay these rails. Uh, many, many people died on this, uh, in this particular venture. We also kind of get a picture here of some African Americans who were working on the, uh, on the railroads. Of course, we have a real uh, good image here of, um, of an African American work crew on the railroad. Of course, the overseer is a white guy. Um, and ultimately, the, uh, the Transcontinental Railroad will be completed in 1869 at a little ceremony called the Wedding of the Rails, where the, uh, the rails were connected, the, uh, the adjoining locomotives bumped their cow catchers uh, to symbolize a kiss, and um, the, uh, the people who actually built the railroad were allowed to celebrate their accomplishment. Well, uh, 
not everybody, of course. If you take a look at who's in this picture, um, you won't see any Chinese people and you won't see any African Americans. They were not asked to participate uh, in this particular celebration. So what we're looking at is mostly the, the white uh, laborers who were working on this, on this railroad. But either way, by 1869, the Transcontinental Railroad was open for uh, complete business at this stage of the game. Now, when we're looking at this Transcontinental Railroad, the Transcontinental Railroad was so absolutely transformative that we can actually hit on pretty much all of the themes uh, that AP stresses in its, uh, in its curriculum. So, uh, and we've never really specified these before, but in AP we're working on seven distinct themes. Identity. How, do pe how did the American people develop an American identity? How, why is it that I, I see myself as being an American and exactly what does that mean? Uh, work exchange and technology, or in other words, e economics in essence. Uh, peopling. Um, how, did we, how did we grow as a people? Well, you know, the, uh, uh, increasing the population of our nation. Uh, politics and power. How is power distributed uh, in our society and, and who wields power and how do they wield power? Uh, America in the world. Okay? How are we interacting with other nations? Uh, environment and geography, what is our uh, ecological footprint, if you say, so to speak, and ideas, beliefs, and culture. Uh, how did an American culture develop uh, over time? And railroads, the Transcontinental Railroad is going to talk about all of these particular issues. So, uh, you know, to make use of time, as, as it were, um, of course, the most basic uh, theme that, uh, that the Transcontinental Railroads is going to influence is people. People! are going to be traveling all over the country at this stage of the game. We can kind of see through this, uh, from this map here that, um, that the, uh, the railroads are going to expand, and where these railroads expand, they are going to carry people. And, of course, what we see is uh, some, uh, uh, a core of people here in the West, but what happens uh, you know, as, as these railroads expand westward? We actually start to see the circle start to expand westward um, a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more um, with these population centers now wait, now wait a minute look at here today what happened it looks a lot thinner well yeah we don't need the railroads quite as much we now have a freeway um, but by 1950 of course the railroads are at their peak um, and they are transporting Americans all over the world. Of course, in the 1950s is when the federal uh, interstate highway system was put into effect, and the, uh, the allure and the uh, value of railroads is going to decrease significantly in that time. Um, so we have shifting patterns in, de in demographics. Uh, the railroads were also a, um, a kind of a pull factor for immigrants. Uh, not only were immigrants coming into the United States to work on the railroads, but because the railroads are going to open up vast tracts of real estate, um, it's always a good idea to get more people who are interested in buying your real estate. And, of course, uh, the, uh, the, the landowners and developers of that time would advertise in Europe, of course, to the good countries in Europe, right, the good white countries in Europe, um, and to encourage them to come to the United States to purchase land. And, of course, this raises the value of the property and the value of the land. Um, we also have to understand that as white European Americans were moving westward, they were coming into open competition with Native Americans. And Native American culture, uh, in the face of this overwhelming white um, Eurocentric culture, Euro-American culture, are starting to you know, really retreat. Native American tribes that had resisted um, Western expansion for many, many years are now facing a very, very arduous obstacle in trying to preserve their cultures and preserve their way of life. Um, but the economic impact of these railroads was just just astronomical. It was, it was uh, the, to, to a certain extent, the railroads were the became the backbone of the American Industrial Revolution. Now, uh, of course, uh, this is a mutual relationship. Uh, you, you, of course, you can't have railroads which are made of iron and steel and rubber and uh, are fired by coal and oil. Um, 
you can't have all of that without some form of industrialization already in place. You have to be able to build these locomotives. And that was not something that you could just go to a, uh, a craftsman to do. That was something that came out of in industry. Um, but at the same time, the development of the railroads is going to spur more industry. Think about it. If I'm building railroads, I need lots and lots of iron. So if, I, if there is an iron factory that is helping me to make parts uh, for my railroad, and uh, all of a sudden there's a demand for more railroads, well, guess what? The iron industry is going to expand. And of course, it becomes very important to try to refine that iron, and ultimately we will refine that iron in what's called the Bessemer pro a process that was developed in England uh, that will be brought to the United States by Andrew Carnegie, whom we'll, we'll talk about later, um, and actually create steel, which is a much more efficient uh, uh, metal to use. But think about all of the other industrial elements that are, that are put into effect here, not just steel, but coal, rubber, um, um, anything, wood, uh, logging, and um, and wood is brought in to help create these these railroads. So, uh, so this is a tremendous, tremendous uh, spur to industrial demand. We need this stuff just to build the railroads. We need to have access to these uh, to to these to, to these these raw materials. But also think about it: the railroads are moving west, and we're moving west into lands that haven't been mined, that haven't been uh, extracted. So now, all of a sudden, the United States has access to even more raw materials than it had before when it was starting its industrialization. And these raw materials can be shipped to the factories and to the manufacturing centers cheaper than ever before, which of course increases the, the demand for those raw materials and the availability of those raw materials. And that means that we can actually build more industries and more, uh, you know, more manufacturing. So there is definitely some kind of a cycle here that, it, that involves industrialization and the railroads and kind of a feedback loop that's going to last right up until 1950. Um, but we also, not only that, but as, as these, uh, these rails get connected, we also find ourselves expanding our demand base. Of course, now, uh, if, I have a, uh, if I have a manufacturing center and I'm making widgets in New York, and I was able to ship my widgets all the way to Cleveland, um, that was pretty impressive. But now I can ship my widgets all the way to San Francisco and Sacramento and Los Angeles. This is, uh, this is opening up vast numbers of, of, uh, of, of markets for me. It's going to increase my demand. And of course, if it increases the demand for my products, there's more of a reason for people to invest in my company, uh, knowing that because of the railroads, I can expand my business and grow, and my business will become more valuable. Uh, so, this is, so the railroads are actually going to spur investments. Investments not just in railroads themselves, but in any business that can actually use these railroads to advance their profits and their, and their, their bottom line. Um, of course, um, you know, farming is going to be, is going to be spurred by this. Uh, probably one of the great stories of the railroads is, uh, is, has to do with a, a phenomenon known as the long drive. Uh, cattle ranchers in Texas, like uh, Charles Goodyear, um, were, uh, they, they, had, they were sold their cattle largely to local markets, but now because of the railroads, they can actually, um, if they can get their cattle to the railroads, then they can actually sell their cattle on a global market, in a, a, in a, in a global market. Um, so, uh, of course, there, if there are no railroads around, you've got to bring your cattle to the railroads. So, um, so Charles Goodyear and, and his, uh, his partner, Loving, um, they are, they're going to actually create the Goodyear Loving Trail, and they're going to bring their, uh, their, their cattle to the, nearest, uh, to the nearest town and sell their cattle. And these, uh, these cattle towns, would, uh, the railroad would come in, and these cattle would come in. Before you know it, these towns were full of cattle, uh, and uh, they would, the cattle would be, then be put onto trains and largely taken to Chicago, which became the meatpacking center of the world as a result of the railroads. Uh, the, the meat would, uh, would be stripped and would be packaged and would be canned and they could be sold anywhere uh, as a result of this, uh, this technology. So um, this was something known as the long drive and this is where the actual uh, myth of the American cowboy comes from. So talk about, so we're also now overlapping with some of those cultural influences and this idea of an American culture. Um, 
Ironically, the, um, the railroads are also going to put an end to the long drive because the same trains that are going to car carry cattle to the marketplaces and to the meatpacking centers are also going to carry farmers uh, and a brand new technology of that time called barbed wire uh, into the prairies. Now this is going to become a huge problem. Uh, as, uh, as cattle drivers start to drive through farmland, there's going to be a lot of conflict between farmers and cattlemen. Uh, ultimately, the, this conflict is not going to be settled with guns, although a pretty hardy attempt was made to do just that, um, but rather by using barbed wire and wiring in, the, uh, in your uh, lands, and this is of course going to bring an end to what was known as the open range, the ability of cattlemen to just graze their cattle on federal lands. Um, the open range is going to be closed uh, shortly in the, late in, in the late 19th century. Of course, um, among other markets that were developed, uh, here's some uh, interesting uh, young men out west, looks like maybe Oregon. And uh, what do you see on that side? Wives wanted, wives wanted. Well, because of the, uh, the um, transcontinental railroad, travel became a lot easier. Many of some of these settlers who had settled before the transcontinental railroad were ready to settle down. They made their, uh, they got their piece of the pie. They're ready to settle down. But there are no available women in the in those territories. So uh, they, but fortunately, as a result of the railroads. You could actually go into a catalog and you could order yourself a male 